Hi, everyone. Uh, first off, I want to thank the organizers for putting this together. Uh, the program this week is really exciting. Um, yeah, so today I will be talking about uh, GPQA, a graduate level Google proof Q&A benchmark we made in the align NYU Alignment Research Group last year. So we basically set out to make the hardest science benchmark that we could. Uh, to do this, we recruited about 60 PhD level experts in biology, chemistry, uh, and physics. And we had them write uh, roughly 200 multiple choice questions. We paid them well, and they spent about 1,200 hours uh, writing, validating, and revising their questions. When we released the benchmark about a year ago, GPT-4 got 36% uh, accuracy. Uh, that's zero shot chain of thought. Uh, which is just above 25%, which is the floor. Uh, that's the accuracy you'd get from guessing, uh, since the multiple choice questions have four answer choices. Some of you may have seen that just a few days ago, OpenAI announced that they achieve 78% accuracy uh, with their O1 model. Um, to put that into some perspective, uh, human expert accuracy ranges uh, from about 65 to 80%, depending on how exactly you measure it. Um, so O1 scores similarly to human uh, domain experts roughly a year after the best performing model uh, got uh, just a bit above chance accuracy. So this raises a question, uh, is, is our benchmark dead on arrival? Um, in just one year, uh, models are already roughly on par with human expert accuracy, so I'm left wondering, maybe, maybe somewhat embarrassingly, uh, if you know, making this was, was a big waste of time, effort, and money. Um, I have some thoughts on this that I'll come back to in a bit, uh, but before then I think it'd be helpful to spend a few minutes talking in detail about uh, how we actually made the benchmark to hopefully help interpret what uh, this rapid progress uh, over the past year means. So how did we set up the process such that we can actually trust that the questions in the data set are both objective and difficult? At a very high level, experts write questions, they validate each other's questions in their same domain, and they attempt to answer questions that are out of their domain of expertise, uh, and they, when doing this, they, they use Google and any internet resources uh, they can find. So to start with, uh, about 550 questions were initially written. We had about 100 in biology and a bit over 200 each in chemistry and physics. Um, here are a couple example questions from organic chemistry and astrophysics. Uh, so, uh, meth methyl cyclopentadiene, which exists as a fluxional mixture of isomers, was allowed to react with meth methyl isoamyl ketone and a catalytic, okay, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, uh, yeah, how many, how many chemically distinct isomers make up the final product? I won't embarrass myself further uh, by, by attempting to read uh, the rest of these examples, um, but hopefully from kind of a quick skim, uh, you can get the gist. Um, these aren't cherry picked, uh, so I think these are pretty like representative of the uh, overall kind of uh, types of questions and uh, and and level of of them. Okay, so we want to measure whether or not the questions are objective. We want to see if they uh, we, we want to make sure that they don't contain kind of subjective opinions of the question writers uh, and that they don't contain mistakes. Uh, the way we do this is we have experts in the same subdomains. Um, so so within biology uh, we have molecular biology, genetics, uh, within physics we have a number of subdomains, uh, electromagnetism, uh, so on. Um, so we have experts in the same subdomain try to answer each other's questions, uh, and if they answer correctly, um, this is evidence, uh, we, we take this as evidence that the question is objective, uh, and conversely that answering incorrectly, uh, uh, we take that as evidence of expert disagreement, uh, and so we may not want to include uh, those questions in the kind of final data set. Uh, we also consider questions where uh, domain expert uh, validators answer incorrectly, but after seeing the question writer's explanation and the correct, uh, or the answer choice that the question writer indicated, uh, they demonstrate to us that they clearly just made a mistake. Um, like, oh yeah, um, uh, I forgot to carry the two, and so obviously, you know, yeah, I totally agree with this question. We, we want to include these questions because uh, we think they're still reasonably likely to, to be objective, uh, even, even though the uh, expert validator uh, answered incorrectly initially. And so we call this post hoc agreement. Um, so, yeah, to measure difficulty, um, we have people try and answer questions in domains different from theirs. Um, uh, yeah, as, as 
kind of Chris eloquently put earlier, uh, knowledge is different from reasoning and, intel and intelligence, and we want to try and, uh, so, so yeah, it's important to compare LLM performance to, to human performance. Um, so yeah, the way, the way we do this is we have people answer questions that are in different uh, domains of, of expertise from them, um, and uh, crucially, we give them complete access to the internet, and uh, we, we pay them very well, and uh, so um, we can kind of expect that if it's the case that they're not able to answer these questions correctly, uh, this is a lot of evidence uh, that the questions are indeed really difficult and don't contain kind of short snippets of evidence on the internet uh, that would kind of give, give away the answers, um, which uh, may, may be the case uh, if we kind of don't do this validation. Uh, yeah, this is, this is uh, uh, kind of ju just representing this process. Um, so uh, we have people try and answer questions from uh, the other domain. So we have biologists answer chemistry and physics questions uh, using Google um, and, you know, vice versa. Uh, when people do this, uh, they get 34% accuracy and this is uh, them spending over 30 minutes on average attempting each question. Um, and this is where the kind of Google proof uh, uh, term comes from uh, in that the questions are indeed very difficult uh, even when you are using Google. Okay, so how do we use these metrics? Uh, we create, we, we use them to create two higher quality subsets of the initial set of questions. Uh, so uh, we create the main set of questions which is around 450 questions uh, by removing questions where both domain uh, expert validators disagreed with the question writer. Um, uh, and we also remove questions where all non-domain uh, validators, so people answering questions from other domains, uh, answer correctly. So we want to remove questions that are likely to contain mistakes uh, and uh, or, or um, uh, uh, are, are likely to be uh, way too easy. Um, we further filter to the diamond set, which is around 200 questions, uh, and these are questions where all domain experts agree uh, and where the majority of non-domain experts uh, answer incorrectly. So these are likely to be both the most objective uh, and the most difficult questions. One important aspect uh, to the design of this validation process is that most of the experts pay actually comes from bonuses when people, uh, when, when they answer correctly. I think this is really important because otherwise we wouldn't know whether or not uh, the non-domain expert validators in particular um, are kind of giving up uh, after, you know, trying for, for a few minutes. Um, so. Um, they're, they're, they're highly incentivized to uh, kind of actually stick it out and, and, and try really hard to, to answer correctly. Um, and I think this makes uh, their, their low accuracy a more significant and, and kind of meaningful result. Okay, so I want to come back to this question I asked earlier of, uh, yeah, did, did, did we waste our time uh, making this benchmark? So, um, the standard approach to, to benchmarking frontier AI systems is to create a data set that uh, models start out doing poorly on, people then spend the next, uh, you know, five to ten years or so developing methods that improve their model's performance uh, while hopefully not overfitting, uh, up until AI systems reach roughly human level, uh, and then the benchmark kind of stops being as useful to improve the frontier uh, and, uh, uh, you know, people kind of switch over to, to harder uh, benchmarks. So this slide shows a bunch of standard, mainly NLP benchmarks, and how the best reported performance on them uh, improves over time relative to human baselines. Uh, this is from the Stanford AI Index uh, 2024 report. Um, and this is GPQA's performance curve uh, over the past year. Um, this is like, I, I, I just kind of, uh, I don't know, eyeballed it, so, so don't like place too, 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 too much uh, stock in the you know, exact position. Um, but the overall story is, is, uh, is pretty clear. Um, yeah, so for some context, we spent about six months uh, kind of actively building this benchmark, and within a year, it's you, you know, in the ballpark of, of being saturated. Um, furthermore, I don't think it's likely that this is a result of uh, any kind of very extreme cheating or, or, or memorizing of, of answers. Um, so we held out 18 questions from the benchmark um, uh, th that were randomly sampled from the main set, uh, and we validated that O1 preview uh, gets very similar accuracy to the reported result uh, in the zero-shot chain of thought setting. Um, so, yeah, as, as, as Chris discussed a few minutes ago, um, you know, bench, benchmarks like these uh, definitely don't kind of 
come close to representing the full picture of intelligence and reasoning. Um, but I think there is something very real here. Um, yeah. Over the past year, I've had a bunch of people ask me if I'm if I'm making another version of GPQA, kind of as uh, over the past. Yeah, every, every time a new model comes out, kind of uh, someone asks me if, uh, uh, yeah, like oh now now that performance is, is so much better, are you are, are you going to make an even harder version? Um, and I found this question hard to answer because we kind of set out to make the hardest benchmark that we could. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, there's this question like what comes next? Um, I do think there are probably a few more kind of iterations or, or cycles that we can collectively spend on, on this paradigm of, uh, of benchmarking, but my overall experience make, uh, w with this data set has made me believe that overall, at, at, at least at this current time, this approach isn't sustainable. Um, it seems to me just that the rate of progress is too fast for us to kind of produce benchmarks like this quickly enough. Um, at the same time, we, we of course need to be able to evaluate and understand the capabilities and behavior of our, our increasingly capable AI systems, both to improve them and to make them safe and cooperative. Um, so in other words, we, we have this need to develop methods that allow us to more easily evaluate the outputs of AI systems that have more knowledge or capabilities uh, than the people evaluating them, um, without needing to kind of rely on, yeah, on this like slow and expensive uh, expert oversight process. Um, that, that kind of went into to creating, uh, you know, this benchmark, for example. Another way of framing this uh, is that we want to move from this status, current status quo where we evaluate AI systems purely from existing knowledge that humans have collected or created independently from AIs uh, to a world where AI systems help us evaluate them more easily uh, uh, despite them potentially already having more knowledge or expertise in, in, in certain ways, at least, uh, than us. A question emerges, which is, how could you evaluate in principle whether or not a kind of more knowledgeable system is actually helping you? Because by definition, you're, you're trying to get its help uh, on questions where you don't already have the answers. Um, right? We, we, we want to kind of generalize to, to this case where we don't know, we don't know the answers already. Um, so yeah, we, we, uh, we, we want to be able to evaluate them or, or t for them to help us evaluate them uh, and us to trust this assistance. So one idea in order to be, uh, for, for us to be able to develop these sorts of methods um, uh, where AI systems can help us evaluate them is, is to simulate this evaluation process. Um, so what, what do I mean by that? Um, uh, yeah, if we want to eventually evaluate superhuman systems, first we could develop methods that allow non-experts, human or AI, to oversee and evaluate AIs that currently have more expertise than them. If we design these oversight methods well, we may expect them to generalize to the situations where no human already has the knowledge uh, or information being evaluated. Um, this is just a summary slide. I, I'm, I'm somewhat out of time. Um, in order to develop these methods, we need tasks and benchmarks where we already have objective ground truth answers and where there exists an expertise gap between people, which is what allows us to simulate this oversight process. Um, I, I actually think GPQA fits these criteria pretty closely. Uh, we've measured expert agreement, and it's extremely difficult for smart, motivated non-domain experts with full internet access, which makes it a realistic simulator of this kind of superhuman AI scenario. Um, so despite the rapid progress as a pure capabilities benchmark, uh, I think GPQA can be very useful for uh, developing scalable oversight methods uh, that help us evaluate uh, uh, increasingly powerful AI systems. OK, sorry for, for running a bit over. Thank you. Okay, thanks, David. So we have time for one, only one question. Yeah. Love your slides. Uh, I would like to ask if there is any reason why um, you ask kind of like to write a new questions uh, instead of using like existing questions from exams or textbooks or like starting from the existing questions. That's a great. That's a great question. Um, so one one. Uh, reason is we wanted to create uh, new questions that um, uh, are not kind of already widely shared online, um, and so it was important to us uh, that um, yeah we kind of created the questions from scratch. Um, another were, were there were there were a number of kind of particular design decisions um, that we that we made in the questions. Um, so a lot of questions from exams, for example, um, are answerable if you have access to the internet because the exam is designed to kind of test a human uh, you know knowledge. Uh, in, in, in some other setting. Um, and, and there are a number of other kind of design considerations. Um,
but yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to chat more about that uh, at, at my poster in a few minutes. Thank you very much. Okay, let's thank David again.